So I played Bethesda's highly anticipated space RPG, Starfield, on the first day that it was available in early access, and I've been asked repeatedly to sum up my opinion about the game, and if I had to do so as succinctly as possible, my response would be, Starfield is very likely the most disappointing RPG experience I've ever had. I have no desire to play any more than the five or so hours I've put into it thus far, and I genuinely regret playing as much as I did because now I'm past the point where I have any real chance of getting my $100 back. Now is it really fair to judge a game so harshly with such a limited experience playing it? Well I suppose that you can be the judge of that as this video is my attempt to shed light on what my experience was like and where I'm coming from to hopefully justify why I feel this way and maybe provide a bit of perspective so that others can get an idea if this game is going to be for them or not. Now for context, I haven't read any reviews, I haven't watched any other videos, I haven't watched anybody else's gameplay. All I've heard thus far from friends of mine and from some of my community members is either that they've heard that it's gotten pretty good reviews or that they're enjoying it themselves. But otherwise, I'm going to be sharing my totally unfiltered and hopefully unbiased opinions based on my short time playing the game. But remember that taste in video games is subjective. Different people value different things. Some people care about realism, some people care about immersion, some people care about narrative, others only care about combat and exploration. The things that are important to me might not be important to you, so just keep that in mind. Now, leading up to its release, in my opinion, this game had everything going for it. In so many ways, it's a spiritual successor to some of my favorite games of all time from the same developers, games from the Elder Scrolls and Fallout franchises. Starfield is, on paper, everything I've wanted for so long from a video game, a massive space RPG, a perfect mashup of two of my favorite genres. And even though a lot has changed with both gaming as well as myself since I've last dove deep into a Bethesda game, I approached Starfield's release with an open mind and tempered expectations. Now that's not to say that I wasn't at least optimistic. I thankfully missed the unmitigated disaster that was the launch of Fallout 76, and in the last decade there's been so many iconic flops and failures from AAA game devs that have been making clear and obvious all of the things not to do that I perhaps naively found it hard to believe that they wouldn't be doing everything possible to be on top of their game this time around, right? Well, I feel like I can confidently say that the opening few hours of Starfield fell short on nearly every single conceivable level for me. From the most basic principles of game design, character design, dialogue, world building, and storytelling, which were the things that every single Bethesda game that I enjoyed before this, imperfect as they all are, always at least delivered something that I considered acceptable. A word that I honestly wouldn't use to describe pretty much anything I experienced in the first few hours of Starfield. Now, historically, the intro sequences to Bethesda games are by no means paragons of game design or storytelling. Some begin with cutscenes that establish the tone and setting of the world, sprinkling in some history and flavor to introduce players, especially those who might be new to their respective series, to the world that they're going to be inhabiting throughout their gameplay. Others might be a tad bit slower, heavier on dialogue and exposition, but I would argue that they all successfully accomplish multiple goals in their own ways. Whether you're escaping prison alongside an emperor fleeing from assassins, learning of your destiny to save the world from the evils that descend upon the lands through fiery gates of hell, to narrowly avoiding your execution and fleeing from a burning town amidst a dragon attack, to witnessing your own grave being dug right next to you just before, for reasons yet unknown, a mysterious man puts a gun to your head and pulls the trigger, to overhearing a news broadcast from the other room that interrupts your rather quaint and mundane 1950s suburban family routine, with reports of some kind of foreign military attack, massive flashes of light, the loss of contact with major cities around the country, your quiet little life turned upside down in an instant, culminating in your panicked rush to get to a shelter just before you experience firsthand what exactly the news had been reporting just moments before. We're gonna be okay. I love you. Oh my God! Within each of their first hour of gameplay, each of these Bethesda intros served to establish the setting and the tone, introduce players to the conflict that would be the basis for the story while also establishing the attitudes and motivations of some of the major characters and factions within it, as well as introduce players to the various systems and mechanics that will hopefully enhance their overall role-playing experience, allowing for multiple distinct ways to approach the different problems and challenges that they were going to be facing along the way. Now once again, while each of these iconic Bethesda intros are in no way without their own flaws and issues, I would argue that they're all still generally successful at getting most players invested in and curious about the story and the conflicts and characters at the heart of them, as well as get them excited to play whatever role they're imagining in whatever way that they want to. 
In my first hour of playing Starfield, what I experienced almost felt like a parody of all of my favorite Bethesda games. Oh, uh, hi. Excuse me. Like a low-budget clone made by some unknown indie developer with a slightly more modernized engine. The entire experience felt like a caricature of all of the best Fallout and Elder Scrolls games. Awkward and uncanny in exactly the same way that the NPC animations and interactions somehow still are after a quarter of a century. Allow me to summarize the first 15 minutes of the intro. Your time is almost entirely spent following characters through the least interesting environment imaginable, walking and talking with you effectively acting as a glorified cameraman. All of the characters that you're forced to listen to have dialogue that only serves to make them seem unlikable, repeatedly making irrelevant or ambiguous references that serve no narrative purpose and showcase confusing and inconsistent motivations. Lynn and Heller are like an old married couple, except without any of the charm. All of their dialogue is effectively pointless bickering back and forth, throwing in completely empty references to random events or pointless comments in some half-hearted attempt at character development and world building that ultimately fails to accomplish either. Listen to this uninterrupted 40 seconds of dialogue, and ask yourself if it tells us anything meaningful about the world that we're about to immerse ourselves in. And, you know, let's be honest, it ain't exactly astrophysics. That's why I keep him around. Good pep talks. Yeah, and the fact that I can pinpoint a helium deposit from 300 meters. <laughs> Not untrue. A shame we won't find any down here. But the metal deposits alone should pay for our own helium. Hell, after this, we'll have enough jump fuel to bounce from one end of the settled systems to the next. Hey, more minerals, more money. And so the cycle repeats itself. Just no more unauthorized jumps in a house for room space, okay? He's just a big baby. There are worse lives. Are we supposed to like either of these characters? Are we supposed to know where we are, how we got here, what we're here to do? What was the point of that 40 seconds of dialogue? It's actually impressive how much is said without actually communicating anything at all. Now for a bit of contrast, let's compare that to the first 40 seconds of Skyrim dialogue, where we actually learn about the conflict that's going on between the important entities in the world, how we managed to accidentally stumble our way into it, and how precarious our current situation is. Walked right into that Imperial ambush. Same as us. And that thief over there. Damn you Stormcloaks. Skyrim was fine until you came along. Empire was nice and lazy. If they hadn't been looking for you, you could have stolen that horse and been halfway to Hammerfell. What's wrong with him, huh? Watch your tongue. You're speaking to Ulfric Stormcloak, the true High King. Ulfric? The Jarl of Windhelm? You're the leader of the Rebellion. But if they captured you... Oh, gods. Where are they taking us? While also managing to introduce a few different characters that serve a few different purposes. The back and forth between the first two characters introduces one that I personally think is quite likable, and he undoubtedly has a couple of genuinely great, memorable lines that introduce some actual emotion into the scene that I personally love. Hey, what village are you from, horse thief? Why do you care? A Nord's last thoughts should be of home. It also introduces another character who's totally unlikable, and that's entirely intentional. They're there to be a temporary antagonist in the conversation, adding a bit of conflict to the conversation to push it forward, allowing us to learn more about the who, what, where, why, and when of the story. And that intentional unlikability even ends up having a satisfying payoff. Now, the third character we're introduced to doesn't have any dialogue at all, for obvious reasons, and I think it was actually quite clever of them to do that. It gives his character an air of mystery and importance, and leaves it up to us to consider if they're the good guy or the bad guy in the story, with that ambiguity ultimately paying off as it becomes an important decision that we have to make as characters in the conflict of the main storyline. Lynn repeatedly makes references to making sure that you work slow, steady, and safe. And Heller is the irreverent, sarcastic one who doesn't really take any of it seriously. Go steady, go safe, go home with a pocket full of credits at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. It's just like, um, yeah, I work in the Stardock, except uh, with more cave-ins, lasers, and accidental dismemberment. Check on Isabel. Make sure she eases up on the breach. I don't feel like getting buried alive today. Remember, Dusty, keep your breathing steady and never take that helmet off down here. 
And then later on, for some inexplicable reason, their roles swap entirely, with Lin seemingly becoming reckless, suddenly and out of nowhere having an odd sense of urgency, while being completely indifferent to your character's safety, entirely disregarding the genuine concerns that are completely out of character for Heller, going against everything that's been established in the first few minutes. Problem? Uh, not if you consider a spike in gravity readings a problem. I don't. You don't? What we're after, it'll read as an anomaly. That's what I was told, anyway. Okay, now you're starting to freak me out. Relax. It's just another job. Come on. <laughs> Lynn, seriously, uh, there's something really effed up about this. Something goes wrong in there. We'll come get you. Uh, <laughs> why would anything go wrong? Would you shut up? Both of you do your jobs. Client is on his way. Since when were we in such a rush? Where did this whole thing about looking for something specific for a client come from all of a sudden? They just spent all this time telling me how this was going to be a normal day mining, just like my first day on the job. None of it makes any sense. Like, the intro was written by two entirely different people with two completely different ideas for who the characters were and what direction the story was going to go. I can't make up my mind if the writers were trying to get us to like and respect her for being some kind of professional mentor with maternal concerns, or to think that she's just a heartless, selfish bitch who only cares about money and not being annoyed or inconvenienced. I still have no idea why exactly we're here. Did we actually care about mining any of the resources that we were collecting, or was it actually all just for the artifact for this client? I'm pretty sure not even the writers know. You make your cut, you get your cut. No exceptions. Come on, pick it up! Client's on his way, then we all get paid. Either way, we got what we were looking for. All this trouble for that stupid thing? Huh. Sure don't look like much. Never mind what it looks like. It's worth more than this mine has pulled in all month. Now that we've been attacked, oh, we've got to pack up and move on. Argos will come for the rest of us. Now what's worse is that amidst the attitude whiplash that we've just gone through are repeated references to our being important or special. I mean, we must be, right? We made it to our second day on the job, after all. You know, most Dusties don't even make it this far. I have a good feeling about you. At no point in the intro is there any explanation, justification, or compelling demonstration of us being special for any reason. Our only evidence is that we had a weird, ambiguous vision and then passed out after we touched some entirely unknown object. Like, at least in Oblivion, our face came to the Emperor in a dream, so it's established immediately that we are supposed to be the one to fulfill some kind of prophecy. And in Skyrim, we discover that we're Dragonborn after learning that we have the power to shout. But in Starfield, as far as I can tell, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and are just repeatedly told you have some kind of importance or significance for vague or undefined reasons. Is this supposed to, like, make us excited to embark on some epic adventure? Because as far as I can tell, it feels like we're just being used by a bunch of people pretending to be our friends who don't want to tell us anything about what's going on so that we can do their jobs for them because they can't be bothered to. You were one of the weirdest hires I've ever had. From hacking computers to digging for minerals, you're lucky our turnover rate is so high. You dug up the artifact, right? That means you saw it. The visions? You're coming with me to Constellation. You're part of this now. I, I, I know, I know, but he's not some miner anymore, Lin. Soon as he touched that rock, something changed. Don't tell me you can't feel it. Fine. It's a deal. Basically, all of the remaining dialogue is just random side comments referencing uninteresting and unimportant aspects of the world that feel like half-assed attempts at world building. It's the kind of stuff that would barely pass as side dialogue from random NPCs walking down the street let alone the primary dialogue from the most important characters in the literal opening minutes of a primarily story-focused game. Know what I love about working in Freestyle Collective Space? Oh, yes. A job like this in the United Colonies? <laughs> Dreams of great. Just no more unauthorized jumps in the house for room space, okay? Like, what the fuck is that line? Why include this in the intro? It feels like they were trying to do something like this. I'm Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. Yes, indeed. If it's a fast ship. Fast ship? You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. Now the difference is, is that Star Wars can get away with throwing around random lingo and referencing things that the audience doesn't know anything about, because what Han Solo is saying here serves a purpose. 
It's a flavorful way of communicating what's obvious to everybody watching. You don't have to know what the Kessel Run is, or know that a parsec is a unit of measurement, to know that what Han Solo is saying here is... I'm fast as fuck, boy. And because after all of that, none of the narrative makes any sense at all, because they've done zero in the way of environmental storytelling, world building, lore, and character development, at the end of the intro, they have to do this. Now, questions? Wait, tell me why again I'm going, and why not you? Why are you just giving me your ship? Who the fuck even are you, or the organization you work for? What exactly is it that I found, and why is it important? Really, the only reasonable question to ask here is, why was the Crimson Fleet after you? If the game actually did its job when it came to storytelling, we wouldn't have to ask any of these questions. And even the answers that he gives to most of these questions don't actually do that either. So instead, only moments later, we have this. Barrett would say that billions of years ago, we were all one with the cosmos. So technically, you have known each other forever. But the more practical answer is likely that he needs you. The number of known people who have been affected by the artifacts is now two. Without your investment in Constellation's mission, he may never know more about the experience you both share. So he is showing you trust in order to gain your support. Now, this whole thing still wouldn't have been remotely close to a great intro, even if they used it as an opportunity for a cheap and easy lore dump that many people could argue Skyrim was. At the very least, giving us some of that backstory, establishing meaningful character and relationship development, throwing in a few interesting tidbits of flavor to pique our interest and color the brand new world that we've been waiting literally 20 years for them to build. But unfortunately, none of the dialogue and at least the first hour of the game remotely came close to doing any of that. With one singular exception. One line of dialogue stood out to me as the only thing that I genuinely cared to learn more about. Hey, I'm just saying they got a reputation. Hell, I bet half the crew here doesn't even believe they really exist. Half the crew doesn't believe Earth exists, but it's still there. That one line says so much about the setting, it paints so much of a vivid picture of the world that we're in that I refuse to believe whoever wrote that fantastic line of dialogue was responsible for any of the other pointless nonsense in the rest of the intro. It forces you to ask yourself how much humanity must have spread out across the universe, how far into the future this must be for the existence of planet Earth, the literal birthplace of our species itself, to be so far away that anybody would be doubting its existence like modern day flat earthers deny the shape of the Earth. I want to know more about that. Now unfortunately, nothing remotely came close to that in the remaining five hours I spent playing the game. And I refuse to accept that that's my fault for not sticking with it until the 20 or 30 hour mark that people are saying I need to get to before it starts to get good. It's the game's fault that it's done nothing to get me to care about the world. Two of its most pivotal moments in the opening, the scenes that should have been the most epic and emotionally compelling moments, both completely and utterly miss their mark. We touch some nondescript alien object and have a weird out-of-body experience that would, for all intents and purposes, be right at home as the animation that you see when you turn on Grandma's old DVD player. Naturally, Bethesda won't let you experience what it is they want you to experience. Instead, they'll just pretend that you saw something more epic and have their characters tell you how much of a life-changing, perspective-shifting experience that it was for you. <laughs> that fun, huh? Not the most gentle push into the great mysteries of space, but hey, been there. Oh, oh, okay, he's been there. It must not have been that crazy of an experience. Sounds like he had it too. Maybe I'm not that special. Come on. You're really not at all curious about that light music show you experienced? Why it only affected you? So wait, now you're saying that it only affected me? Like you literally just told us that you had a similar experience. That means you saw it. The visions? Two seconds later. Because if you didn't notice, we've all been handling it since with no problem. If I didn't notice? At no point have I seen anybody other than Lynn holding onto it. Literally nobody else touches it. So no, I didn't notice anything. And actually, now that you mention it, it sure does sound like she's the special one, no? Somehow immune to whatever powers are inside it? And wait a minute, now you're saying that we've all been handling it, like including yourself. So does it affect you or not? Make up your fucking mind, man. 
Ignoring the fact that, as is par for the course at this point, none of this makes any fucking sense, that moment could have been such an epic moment. A million movies and games did this before. How could they make such an important moment feel so completely and utterly mediocre? Then, just moments later, we have another moment where it seems like they tried to force as much as possible something epic and emotional to happen where it wasn't remotely deserved or earned. Remember your first time emerging from that cave to a vast and beautiful landscape after narrowly escaping your execution and a dragon attack, beginning your new life and embarking on an epic journey? Remember watching the world as you know it come to an end in front of your eyes, then being forced to sit and watch helplessly as your wife is murdered and your son is taken from you, and then eventually emerging into the sunlight for the first time in God knows how many years to set eyes on the world that you left behind to the apocalypse? Remember how impactful those moments were the first time you experienced them? Now picture this. You're at your second day of work. You fell down and you bumped your head, trying to touch a thing you don't know anything about. And now you're about to walk out of the front door of the office into the parking lot to meet somebody you've never met for reasons you don't understand. Are you prepared? Is that really the time to try to force such an epic moment? Did they like finish the game and at the last minute realize they forgot to put in one of those iconic moments that the other games had and just decided to shoehorn this one in here? Or sure, it would have been cool for them to introduce the game in a totally new and groundbreaking way, but I would have been totally happy if they just put a space specific spin on the traditional Bethesda RPG formula, but they couldn't even get that right. Why not literally wait just a couple minutes more and make that moment happen here? Imagine the sound of the rockets rumbling through your entire body, seeing the ground and your peripheral vision falling away faster and faster. The sky slowly fading from blue to black as the atmosphere disappears around you, experiencing your first few moments alone in the vastness of open space. But no, instead, what should have been another incredible moment ended up being a massive disappointment. Because of course, you don't get to fly the ships anywhere near planets in this space game, Taking off and landing and flying fast over the ground and through the terrain exploring the environment are easily some of the most fun parts of most space games despite not actually taking place in space. So of course they're not going to include that in a game like this when they can just make it a single button press, a boring ass loading screen, and kick you out into outer space super far from the planet that you just came from, inexplicably staring back towards the planet you just came from for some reason? What a fucking hack job. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot. They also inexplicably attempted to force in a kind of cliche emotional goodbye at the end here. Just go. Before I say something, I regret. What on God's flat earth would your character be thanking Lin for? You worked for her for less than two workdays. She risked your life for money. She isn't your friend. She's done nothing for you. Why are they trying to seemingly fabricate a kind of relationship here after the fact? And then of course, why does she say this? Before I say something, I regret. I've been racking my mind trying to figure out what she could possibly mean here. What were the writers going for? What could she have said that she would regret? Admit that she had a thing for me all along and it's sad that we didn't get a chance to hook up before I go, or what? Did they accidentally copy-paste in dialogue from another game that they never finished with an entirely different set of characters and story? None of this makes any sense. In the entire intro, there's no conflict, no character development, terrible dialogue, no world building, no excitement, no compelling mystery. This is what I mean when I say that this is a caricature of Bethesda games. How is this remotely acceptable from a company like Bethesda in 2023? But there's literally zero excuses. They have all of the resources in the world. Any voice actor, any dialogue writer would die to go work on a project like this. Did they just hire someone off of Craigslist or get a bunch of random people on Fiverr to script the intro? I don't know about you, but I'm personally baffled. I was originally going to compare Starfield to some other more recent games that I've been enjoying, most notably Baldur's Gate 3, rather than comparing it to Bethesda's own prior work that this game should have been a fresh evolution of. But this particular comparison genuinely seems unfair, as if I'm comparing an NBA pro to a toddler. But let's be honest, Bethesda has no excuse here. They've had all of the time, all of the money, and all of the resources. I just have no idea what they're doing anymore. I walked up to this NPC, I started talking to him, and based on his mannerisms and how he was acting, I figured, oh wow, that's interesting, this guy's blind. That's kind of cool and include- oh, never mind. That's just shitty animation. And then my PC blue screened. 
I genuinely get the impression that Bethesda wanted to fill the experience with as much people and stuff as humanly possible, with every single aspect requiring as close to zero effort as they could manage, and then they just sort of crossed their fingers and hoped that people would just make their way through the game so amazed and impressed with the rich and diverse living, breathing world they created, that nobody would actually take the time to squint their eyes a bit and see that it's all ultimately an incredibly shallow facade. Like I said, I wasn't going to do this comparison, but I can't help myself. I can honestly say, without exaggeration, that conversations with corpses in Baldur's Gate 3 accomplishes infinitely more immersive worldbuilding than any NPC conversation that I had in Starfield. Interactions with basically every animal provides far more meaningful, rich, and rewarding conversational experiences than any of Starfield's NPC interactions. Then my misery becomes another's. More fear, more pain, more memories. I remember hands. Why do I remember having hands? Unironically, I get more flavor from reading any individual tombstone in Baldur's Gate than I did from talking to even the most interesting looking NPCs I came across. Here rots Treston Brumwild, philanderer and wicked excuse for a husband. May the crows use this marker as a privy. Every single extended interaction I have with NPCs in Starfield makes me feel uncomfortable, like I'm talking to something that's not human, but trying its best to pretend to be one. I'm so excited to see Tony after work. Oh, hi there. I'm doing great. How about you? Oh, oh my. I'm very sorry you feel that way. I'm sure things will get better soon. It's important to try and keep your head up. Try to work towards something. Really? Well, I guess you're right. I'm feeling a bit run down. I really love my job, but it's hard work and long hours. I could definitely use a Terracino from Terrabrew right now. Really? That's so sweet. I really appreciate it. Now contrast that with Baldur's Gate, where every single NPC I talk to quite compellingly sells the illusion that they're a real person with real emotions and an actual backstory, not just a handful of pre-canned voice lines. You see a fella on his own on your way in. Dwarf. Balin's his name. Bald. Blue tunic. Dumb as a stick. My useless husband. Sent him for an errand. It's no surprise he's made a mess of it. Knock yourself out. But don't come begging for coin if you find him. You try to ransom him to me, you'll find yourself skint and stuck with a fat old lout. And it's not only the dialogue and the facial animations that are laughably bad for a game in 2023. As far as I can tell, pretty much every other aspect of the game lacks even a remotely respectable amount of attention to detail. When you have a game like Baldur's Gate that has the scale that it does while simultaneously having such an impressive amount of depth and attention to detail, it just goes to show you what you can do if you're capable and care enough to put in the effort. Pretty much every NPC I've come across has their own name, their own voice lines, their own personalities. Each one is itself a fully fleshed out character. Do you think that anybody would be shitting on Larian for skimping on attention to detail if they didn't add the sweat dripping down your face when you're surrounded by lava exploring the underground forge? Nobody would have thought about it. And yet it's that care and attention to detail all over the place that adds up to an incredible experience. The kind of experience that we should all expect and be demanding from a company like Bethesda, especially when we're paying $70 to $100 for the game. And yet as far as I can tell, Bethesda seems to not care about any remotely meaningful detail whatsoever and hasn't thought to handle even the most basic of dynamic interactions that even their own games they made before this had more than a decade ago. We've always considered ourselves explorers, but this really is uncharted territory, is it? Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> but a tip from the UC Vanguard sounds promising. My dog stepped on a bee. I can't take much more of this. I can't take much more of this. As much as I love uncovering new questions, I wouldn't mind a few answers now and then. Best 
best of your abilities, and to uphold the values of the Vanguard. Honor. This is murder! You're on your own! In my remaining hours playing Starfield, I felt simultaneously like my time was constantly being wasted whenever I'd actually take the time to explore every room and box as it was seemingly filled with a confusing proportion of objects that you wouldn't think were lootable items that actually were, although as far as I could tell those items had no value and served no purpose, as well as a bunch of objects that I was hoping to interact with that I couldn't in any way. As far as I know, I explored pretty much every inch of this first building here, some kind of science lab that some space pirates had made into a makeshift base. And after picking up and examining a ton of stuff, rapidly came to the conclusion that almost everything around me was junk and wasn't worth grabbing, only to find out shortly after that the dozen or so digipick items that I passed up, assuming that they were junk, happened to be this game's version of lockpicks, meaning that as soon as I needed one, I conveniently had none. Bro, the, no, all of those fucking digipicks I've been avoiding, they look like flashlights. For fuck's sake, man. Now, this, of course, had me second-guessing myself, wondering if so much of what I assumed was junk that I had left behind might have actually been meaningful, and if I'd end up regretting leaving it there, which ultimately ends up giving me the worst kind of anxiety that I get when I play games like this, where I'm constantly full with junk, not knowing what I need, stressing about what to grab, what to keep, what to drop, what to sell which kind of sucks the fun out of it. Every time I'd come across something that looked like it might have been some scientist notes or something, like some hidden lore, it was a generic notebook object without anything to read, or if it actually was a book you could read, it wasn't world building or lore, it was, for some reason, excerpts from Charles Dickens novels? I never actually thought that I'd be looking back at something like the lusty Argonian maid and thinking that that was something a game like this was missing. Now as is becoming a pattern, in this entire section of the game I found one and only one thing that caught my attention and got me remotely interested in the narrative, and it was a single, short voice recording. You're dead. We're all dead. The comms relay has been trashed. The whole room is trashed. We can't call for help. I can hear the terror morph roaring somewhere, and more people screaming. The character that recorded this is, as far as my experience goes, the most interesting and believable character in the entire game thus far. Now it's also not just the other characters that were unlikable, unrealistic, and unrelatable. I also felt the same way about my own character. I started the game wanting to play as a bit of a space scoundrel. I was literally envisioning a Han Solo type with some roguish elements, coercive, charming, and sneaky. As I covertly approached the first group of unsuspecting enemies that I came across, I was reminded of the dozens of times that I began new playthroughs of games like New Vegas and Skyrim, each with half a dozen different character variations that I can vividly remember based on how I chose to play those characters. Every single other game from Bethesda that I've played before gives you choices, multiple ways to tackle every problem. You can be sneaky, you can go full out aggro, you can be clever and manipulative, and I was excited to see how Starfield would hopefully take this to the next level. What kinds of freedom and agency was I going to have in this regard? Staying true to the character that I wanted to roleplay, as I sneakily made my way over to hopefully do some kind of cool covert takedown on an unsuspecting enemy. <laughs> what? What? Air for combat. No matter what I did, sneaking never worked once. Every time I attempted it, I was either punished or prevented from doing what I wanted, which is entirely antithetical to basically every other RPG game like this, where in the earliest parts of the game, the game itself actively motivates you to try out all of these mechanics like sneaking, lockpicking, persuasion, deception, with all of those first attempts generally being extremely easy to succeed at, to get you familiar with the basics of those mechanics, get you feeling excited to make use of them in all kinds of creative and fun ways, and get you invested and immersed in playing the role that you've been imagining. But not Starfield. And it wasn't just sneaking either. After repeatedly failing to sneak my way through the lab, instead constantly being railroaded into just mindlessly running and gunning the entire time, which was a truly boring and bland experience, I finally come to the first mini-boss character, at which point a conversation is initiated. Now let's just ignore for now that every response option that my character has pretty much all the time is either nonsense or makes my character sound like a complete douchebag. Now recall that I chose to play as the Scoundrel class, which comes along with a bonus to Persuasion. 
the persuasion skill that my character started with literally says that the nuanced ability to listen and discuss can often accomplish far more than simply shooting first and asking questions later, which is exactly what I wanted here. And of course, given this was the first persuasion check of the entire game, I'd basically be able to convince this guy to take his pants off and to do jumping jacks. And yet, despite trying to handle this situation diplomatically and avoid another brainless firefight, choosing what I understood to be the least risky, most likely chance of success option in the persuasion process, as a character with a class that specializes in that specific skill, even that failed. It's like the game is actively trying to prevent me from having fun from accomplishing any role-playing goals, from learning anything remotely interesting about the world, or giving a single fuck about anything or anybody around me. And then there's this asshole. I was gonna go into a bunch more detail, but I'll spare you most of it. He is, simply put, one of the most annoying companions that I've ever had in any Bethesda game, and there have been quite a few doozies. He's constantly running in front of me while I'm trying to fight enemies, he walks up to me and stands right behind me when I'm looting or looking around so that when I turn around, I get jump scared, and then he's just standing there in the goddamn way, body blocking me in a corner so I can't move, and don't even get me started on his AI during combat. And to continue the theme of the game seeming to actively fight against my enjoyment of it, after being boxed in a million corners by this dumpster, at one point I wanted to try and get up on a ledge that was just a bit too high for my character to jump to, and I had a genius stroke to make use of the robot as a bit of a stepping stool. So I tried to boost on his head to help me get up onto the ledge, and lo and behold, they inexplicably decided to make his collision not work on top, but only on the sides. Because what else would a companion in a Bethesda game do than be of no help to me and instead just get in the fucking way? Barrett enjoys this establishment. He frequently buys chocolate here, though I have informed him repeatedly. It is likely a significant contributing factor to his being overweight. Now, I actually really liked the lockpicking system in this game. I think making this a visual spatial logic puzzle is kind of a fresh, clever take on something that's been done a million times that I'm kind of over, and I actually looked forward to making use of this skill more often. I also thought that the graphics, particularly in space, and as long as you ignore the faces, were pretty incredible, although that's basically where my enjoyment of the space aspect of this game begins and ends. I was super excited to dive deep into the ship customization that I had seen teased by Bethesda before, until of course the first time I went to take off the ship and realized that you can't actually fly your ships anywhere near planets at all in this game. All your ship is is a way to fast travel to space, where, as far as I can tell, all that you will experience are annoying fights with enemies that you don't care about, mostly just an inconvenience in between cutscenes as you fast travel to another point in space before choosing where to fast travel on the destination planet. The actual flight and combat was kind of just annoying and clunky, and I'm sure it gets much better later on in the game, but what can I say, I just have no desire to make it that far. The juxtaposition of having a game with this much ship customization, this much detail in controlling your ship and its subsystems, a star system map that literally shows a visual representation of the gravitational well created by the star at the center of it, and yet you can't fly your ships in the atmosphere, you can't get close enough to explore gas giants, ringed planets, or stars in any meaningful or interesting way, and flying towards a planet eventually has you just hitting an invisible wall. The contrast between those two things is just so insanely bizarre to me. It's like they decided to invest a ton of attention to detail into all of the wrong things. And personally, that completely and utterly destroyed any sense of excitement, awe, and wonder related to space exploration that I wanted to experience in this game that they specifically leaned into into the marketing leading up to its release. What can I say? I don't think my expectations are particularly unreasonable or unrealistic. It just feels to me like Bethesda invested zero effort, zero passion, and zero soul into this game and it showed in every single moment of my first few hours playing it. Now, for those of you that are enjoying it, I hope you continue to. For those who were considering trying it out yourself, if none of the things that I complained about here seem like they'd bother you, then hey, this game might be for you. Maybe check out somebody else's review. For everybody looking forward to visiting New Atlantis for the first time, hope you're not agoraphobic. For everybody else, maybe sit this one out for now and see how future updates and maybe mod support can improve things. Who knows? Now to everybody that made it this far into the video, you guys are legends, I appreciate you, and if you're not already subbed, it would mean a lot if you hit the sub button, and I'd love to know everybody's thoughts and experiences with the game in the comments. If you actually want to see a masterclass on RPG game design, come by my Twitch stream. I'm live pretty much every day, and I'll likely be playing Baldur's Gate for a while. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.